The next Philosophy Portal course focuses on Hegel's Philosophy of Right, a text which represents Hegel's most mature political notion of rights. The course starts May 18th, 2024. To find out more, visit philosophyportal.online. Hegel's Philosophy of Right approaches a science exploring the political tension between will and world, as well as their collision into family, community, state, and world spirit. The course runs through May and June, with the first class starting May 18th. There will be five lectures and discussions hosted by myself, Cadell Last, as well as two exegetical reading spaces with philosopher Dimitri Kroimans. You will get access to these courses for a lifetime, as well as an invitation to participate in a student-led conference and the opportunity to submit your own publication for a student-led anthology process. To learn the foundation of Hegel's mature political notion this May and June, sign up now at philosophyportal.online, and I hope to see you on the other side. Did you know that Philosophy Portal is a membership community hosting four different live events every month? These events include Concept Cave, a space to learn core concepts, The Edge, a space to explore the unconceptualized, Thought Lab, a space to learn with thought leaders, and Real Talk, a space to get real in personal self-relation. In April 2024, we will be hosting a Concept Cave on the concept of jouissance, the Edge on Discomfort with theologian Barry Taylor, a Thought Lab on Sex, Evil, and Forgiveness with philosopher Nina Power, and a Real Talk on Living Eros with coach Pamela von Savaljar. To learn more or to get involved, sign up at philosophyportal.online. Philosophy Portal also focuses on publishing community works. We have so far published Enter the Alien, inspired by Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, and Abyssal Arrows, inspired by Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. To find out more, visit philosophyportal.online. You can also find my solo books, Global Brain Singularity, focused on the relation between humans and technological singularity, Systems and Subjects, focused on the relation between general system science and continental philosophy, and Sex, Masculinity, and God, a trialogue about sexual energy and theology. You can find all of these works at philosophyportal.online. Welcome to another Philosophical Conversation. I'm Cadell Last, and I'm here today with philosopher Slavoj Žižek to discuss Christian atheism, how to be a real materialist. First off, welcome to the channel, Slavoj. Everyone who follows my channel, of course, will know who you are. I think first, let's just get into the basic principle of the title Christian atheism, which is, of course, combining two words that many people would presuppose as a contradiction of terms. Um, and just sort of establish what you think's at stake in combining these two terms um, and why you decided to write this book in the first place. Well, as I make it clear, if I remember it correctly, in the first chapter of the book, uh, my, under quotation marks, big enemy is the predominant, how should I call them, liberal atheist stance that you find great principles in atheism, and then they combine this with a vulgar materialism, but in reality, these are illusions. So they recognize what they call Christian moral values or whatever, but they claim they want that they want to maintain them just as what Kant would have called regulative ideals without any ontological commitment, you know. Let's abandon the basic substance of religious belief. Let's just, let's just treat them as beautiful ideals. If I got him correctly, I'm not sure I saw just the title, even the great brutal materialist, Richard Dawkins, did you follow this? Now, he said somewhere, as a religion, Christianity is nonetheless better than Islam, and so on and so on. I want to abandon this easy 
this easy approach because I let like let's just keep the the beautiful sublime ethical content getting rid of the ontological commitments because I think that if you if you do this, it's not that you are too materialist, but you are not materialist enough. Why? How? This brings me to my second thesis. This is for many people the hardest paradox, that uh, through materialism, you cannot assert it directly. You must go through religion and, as it were, enact a shift, a subversive re reversal, whatever, let's not go into it now, within a religious edifice itself. That, uh, in, and this, of course, I then bring together with Hegel's insight about the truth is the path to truth or, or about how. Hegel himself already said in many variations what Lacan in French said, la vérité surgit de la méprise, that in some sense the truth is immanent to méprise is not misunderstanding, it's more the, the error, but error in an existential sense. It's not that I look there, oh, I didn't see it correctly, Error means that existentially, in your subjective position, you are wrong. Uh, and I think that vulgar materialism, the one which doesn't take this path through religion, precisely doesn't in involve a really radical change of your subjective position. Now, the third point, which should be to you, but also to many people who take at least a half serious look on my work. The third point is that Christianity is here privileged. That in some sense, Christianity in itself enacts this passage to atheism. That the fundamental event in Christianity, now I'm simplifying it to the utmost, more not to you, you know this, to our public, that uh, the death and uh, uh, that crucifixion and then uh, uh, Holy Spirit, uh, return of Christ, uh, uh, this is the most concise formula of atheism in the sense that it's well known what I'm doing there, that following Hegel, uh, I, I think that this is unique about Christianity, that all this topic, neognostic of Jesus Christ returning in person or however, that we have to wait for that moment. No, Christ in holy, in the dimension called by Christians, holy. What, which term do you prefer, ghost or spirit? Spirit, ghost, you use ghost. I don't know why, but maybe yeah. spirit would have been better because it has more a Hegelian connotation. I'm sure Hegel would say Holy Spirit. Yeah, that uh, the dimension of Holy Spirit is, uh, how to put it, purely self-relating self autonomous belief. You don't have belief in something out there. The belief itself is the core There's no of, God of the beyond. Yeah, yeah. But, but I, here I remain in the Christian legacy, but I, uh, but I think against this postmodern, or not even postmodern, you can call now the fashionable term, is, if I know it correctly, metamodern. No, metamodern it is not the term, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Against this meta modernist stance, I think that we should retain the notion of belief in a much more substantial thing than just, you know, oh, do you think that, like the very question, do you think that God exists? Do you think that? 
do you really believe in God? Is the wrong question because to put it in Hegel's terms, it involves a certain difference, gap, which is a false one. We are here, God is there, and then do you believe in that or not? Here, although I don't like, but now it's not the time to go into it, Dostoevsky, there is one passage in Brothers Karamazov where Alyosha says very nicely, for me, it was never a question, does Christ exist? Uh, or in this sense, it's uh, believe is the practical question. Is it, can I live as a Christian in Holy Spirit? It's a pseudo problem to ask this question, do I believe in God and so on and so on. And I must tell you that one of my few followers on this line, okay, primarily it's you, but do you know that there are also theologists who are at least interested in my work? For example, I learned that the, you know the guy, uh, uh, Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, no? that he is interested in this, and he promised me that he will write a review soon now of my new book. You know, so again, this is how I try to do it, not, not in the sense of a cheap compromise. Yes, materialism, but you add something. No, my paradox is that to be, as the title of your forthcoming book says, to be a real materialist, you must go through Christianity. It's a modification of belief, but uh, it is uh, an existential modification. Your subjectivity changes, and you know, to amuse more your our readers than you, you don't need amusement. Uh, you know, I quite by chance because my wife didn't see it. So okay, I we watched together. It's not a great movie, but I only liked one moment. Do you know uh, a river? Sorry, uh, uh, a movie directed by Robert Redford. I think the title is uh, something about a river runs through it or whatever. Did you see it? Where Brad Pitt plays a self-destructive character. It's he is beyond redemption, not in the moral sense. He is not evil, but he manages always to get into trouble. People try to help him, but he is lost. We know something horrible will happen to him sooner or later. And when he is finally found dead, beaten by some guys, a priest at his funeral says something simple but very beautiful. He said the message in when you find a person who is in such a situation, you see that he is, he or she, that's another topic, is beyond help. He simply is on self-destructive path. Uh, the truly Christian stance here is not, okay, but let's make a last desperate attempt to convince, no, no. It's simply, your message to him must be simply, I know, I can do nothing. All I can give you is my love, solidarity. But not solidarity in this cheap social sense of, you know, of, of a, a kind of a manipulative help. Like if I tell you this, maybe you will nonetheless find the strength to get out. No, that even if in your utmost self-destructive path, I keep my love for you. And a good friend of mine drew my attention to one fact that in Matthew, there is a wonderful passage where basically Christ demands this. It is the, the night before he knows he will be crucified next day. Uh, he is very thankful. He says to his followers, apostles who are around him, 
can you please just stay with me and like to be vulgar, not fall asleep? Wake with me. So Fantastic. Again, it's a desperate moment for Christ. He knows it's the end. And all he wants is, this is the practice of Holy Spirit. All he wants is just, he's not giving them any big, deep lessons. He's not demanding help from them. Just be here. So again, when I talk about belief, I'm not talking about belief in a simple opposition to disbelief, like, are you just immersed in this city life or do you think there is another dimension? I'm talking about this existential subjective stance. I talk too much, hit me again. Oh, perfect. So a, a few a few notes I want to emphasize in terms of the three points you're emphasizing yeah. there. I think that we can come to sort of um, a, a perspective here that scientific materialism or vulgar materialism in the form that sort of Dawkins and the evolutionists were forwarding is sort of still dependent on a figure of the big other. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, yeah. And in this in this sense, that what they miss in regards to the error you're talking about, the existential error, I think yeah. is best represented in this transition from the logic of there is no big other to there is a non other. So like there is no sexual relationship to there is a non relationship. And to be able to go through that transition, I think would be somewhat similar to the structure of religious belief coming to the understanding of religious belief, there is no God of the beyond to sort of more the position of Christ in in the way you're the way you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and then and finally, again, sort sorry of to interrupt you, but it's crucial here. Now, one criticism that I often get is that, but wait a minute, you get this also in Buddhist community or in some sense in other religions. I don't think you do, you get it anywhere else. And I, you remember, is it- Well, I was gonna make that that point next that, and see what you say on this formula is that I, cause I think this formula, and I think for the for the viewers to know that I think this this concept of Christian atheism, if we go back and study the, the I think the, the you know, the original philosophical materials that could help us better understand yeah. your book, Christian Atheism. If we study Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, specifically those last chapters, I think we could come up with something like the formula, and this I'll propose it to you, is the truth of religion is Christianity, and the truth of Christianity is atheism. So if yeah. we understand that sort of yeah. movement, I think that's, you know, anyway, I'll, I'll throw it back to you on that point. But uh, can I add another uh, uh, I'm sorry if I go into these simple waters, but uh, almost uh, pathetic the, the stand. You know, I did you see, my God, it's an old movie, but there are two versions. I mean, uh, two, two, a movie and the TV series based on this novel. Did you see, but you are relatively young, so I cannot say when you were younger. Did you see, first, I'm talking about John Le Carre, uh, 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 the little drummer girl. Did you see there is the old, uh, old from 84 movie? And then there is, uh, I think it's 19, uh, sorry, 2018, 19, a six part TV series. And in both, the crucial moment is the Arab terrorist who wants to detonate a bomb somewhere in Germany doesn't matter. I don't, so I absolutely don't uh, 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 follow or uh, agree with his commitment. But there is a deeply tragic scene, nonetheless, where truth is on his side. He seduces him voluntarily, although she is employed by. Israeli uh, uh, Mozart probably to helping him to catch him. They spend the night together. She wants to do it. And then in the morning, in a lone house, hut in the middle of a forest, when he awakens, he gets into a panic. He said, my God, I don't see sounds of cows. I don't see hear any cars. So he gets it there already surrounded. And then he confronts her and basically makes her confess without torture. Just she's broken down 
you are not really part of my cause. And then comes a beautiful moment when he realizes that he is betrayed, that he will die. He turns to her and asks her, why did you do this? Are you Jewish? Are you Christian? Were you blackmailed? Were you bribed? Like, he, he gives her all imaginable options. And he, Hans Florence Pugh, who is now popular, uh, 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 plays her, Charlie, called in the novel. She just tells, I am nothing. I don't know what I was doing and so on. And then the guy doesn't do what you would have expected from an Arab terrorist or whatever. Doesn't try to take revenge in the last second, you know, like before they get me, I will shoot you. He just gently approaches her, caresses her face and says, my God, you don't have any belief. You don't believe in anything. I'm sorry for you. And caresses her like with full, full sympathy is too vulgar a word here, a word here. And then just wait, they break in, they shoot him, you know. Now, I don't agree with this. Of course, I'm not in any sense pro-terrorist with his commitment, but I think that his, this guy, Khalil, the terrorist, shock is authentic. Because, you know, his idea is not if to truly believe you must be one of us. <laughs> Islam fundamentalist. His point is just how can you persist? What are you so that you can persist totally outside commitment, just in daily pleasures and so on and so on? So I, I think the terrorist here did stumble upon something quite profound. And I think when he says, but you believe in nothing, his point is not, again, but the only true belief is Islam. He is just searching for the trace of any existential commitment. And uh, this is why I recently, talking with some of my Korean friends, I wrote, I think the title was something like Living in the End of the World, a short comment about how, you know, this is such a stance displayed by this heroine. This is more and more the existential stance today, not so, only in Western societies, but also South Korea and Japan. You, did you see the movie, something like, uh, not Zone of Interest, but uh, A Perfect Life or whatever, the German guy, Wim Wenders, did a movie in Japan with a Japanese actor describing everyday life of a guy who, I don't know, cleans trashes, beans, I don't know, like some totally simple work, but lives a happy life in the sense that he cares about nothing, just small pleasures and so on and so on. And I was told that in South Korea, among millions of people, this is now the predominant attitude. Forget about North Korean th uh, threat or whatever. Just try to enjoy your small life without any metaphysical concerns and so on and so on. This, I think, is the position that I cannot accept. Right. It's, it's kind of just the end result of um, a, a, a certain uh, materialist, I, I guess, let's say it's the end result of, of what you're calling a type of vulgar materialism. Yeah, although the paradox is that here, vulgar materialism can paradoxically rejoin some kind of pseudo deep spiritual wisdom, you know, don't crave for anything, 
find your spiritual satisfaction in modest everyday life and so on and so on. Now I'm coming to your book. Hey guys, those who read me, read Enter the Alien. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, let me, so on that, because you know, uh, maybe if we, and I'm now talking bombastically, if we humans are so screwed up that we cannot, many of us cannot arrive at this deep commitment, the least so-called new right religious fundamentalist. They are for me- That's just, what I wanted to bring up. Yeah, they're for me just, uh, how should I put it, a theological version of vulgar materialism. In the yeah, so that's what I wanted to point that, towards. Yeah, that vulgar materialist think, what's the problem? Our subjective freedom is just, uh, as they say, uh, 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 user illusion, we are just whatever, DNA, subparticles, blah, blah, blah. Uh, do you know that, uh, 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 and I've spoken with some of them, this uh, true fanatically fundamentalist religious guys, for them, they precisely, no matter how much they bluff, they don't, they are not in the Holy Spirit, as we would say. They are, for them, Religious insight is a simple scientific fact. That's how it is. This can also assume a stupid version of uh, of uh, 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 of uh, uh, of a literal reading of the Bible, you know, or a scientific. But for example, I wonder if we already talked about it. I remember that I, in the last five, 10 years, spoke with two people. One was a more intelligent Christian. The other guy was also intelligent, but pure fundamentalist. And ask them, I'm sorry if you know this, but probably our viewers don't know this, a simple question. You know, this was the era of the, Turin Shroud. Is this really a place of Christ? Because there are some stains that, what if this really is Christ's blood? No. And uh, I was pretty provocative. I told them if, because, you know, it was proven conclusively that it was made in 13th, 14th century. But now there is a counter argument that if you have the cloth made from certain material which grows in the Middle East, it 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 can still it is still possible that the cloth is from year zero or 33. Okay, so uh, what fascinated me is that the different answers that I got, the I told them, I asked them a more concrete question. If we presume that the curing Shroud is true, and that that dark, couple of dark stains are really remnants of Christ's blood. What do you think about the idea? Let's just scratch a part of it and do a DNA analysis. Then we will be possible to answer empirically the question, like, did Holy Mary, Christ's mother. Did she had sex with another person or blah, 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 immaculate conception. And it's interesting that the intelligent Christian, not fundamentalist, was horrified at this idea. He even said, this is a wrong approach. It's wrong to do this. It has to remain a pure belief. While I, if you look... Sorry, just, just to want... finish immediately. Yeah, go ahead. Just to you know what the fundamentalist answered me? She accepted this topic. He said, perfect, let's do it if the church will allow it. And I can tell you what we will discover, that uh, since God doesn't have a DNA, that 
the DNA will be simply uh, redoubled Mary's DNA. But what I found so horrible is how he was really thinking about this in he, as the most radical fundamentalist, in purely positive scientific terms. So I think, just to conclude, that it's very important that uh, in the state we are in today, with this globalized ontological indifference, uh, maybe only aliens can awaken us, to put it like this. You know, it, it must be the shock of a real otherness. That's why. Absolutely. You, that's so why this is, this is perfect. Though. Now it's maybe time that I let you to say a word. So this Sorry is this is perfect long. though. Like yeah. I just want to emphasize, like from your book, like what you're taught, what you're emphasizing there with the Turin Shroud to me sounds like a great example of a point you try to make in the book between the the gap that separates uh, objective reality from the transcendental approach. Yeah. Um. And 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 then like sort of the real question I wanted to zero in on here in regards to, um, you know, the atheist core of Christianity, is is this I think mega important distinction that you highlight in the book. So I'm just going to highlight this distinction and yeah. then let let you go. <laughs> so the 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 first distinction which I would take to be the let's say the, the the false fundamentalist move is the principle, God became man so that man will become God. Whereas the, the emphasis that you always emphasize is the fall from God is a fall of and in God himself. And yes. what this distinction, what's at stake in this distinction? Because I think what you say in the preface, which I really like, is that Christianity is unique, not because it's trying to elevate humans to God through pious yes. activity, not leaving behind sinful life, but rather transposing the God rather transposing the gap that separates God from man into God himself. And I think and this mega says, distinct, this, this is, is the most the important most beautiful quote from Hegel, I think from phenomenology. Yes, it, it is. I, but that. I think it's mega I think it's 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 the I think it's the most important theological distinction that yes. you're bringing to the yes. table and Don't you're running with it throughout yes. the book. And I really appreciate that. And so, uh, let's go into another dimension. Although I have big problems with uh Gnosticism, mysticism, but nonetheless, they are under something, you know, which mystics. They are the only ones who I think really see it. This uh, late medieval European tradition, so called Rhine, Rhine, the German river, Rhineish, Rhine mystics, uh, you must go all the way from Meister Eckhart to to, of course, then, Jacob Böhme and so on, they see this clearly, that, that in some sense, there is no God without man. But now we come to a crucial point. Not in this vulgar materialist way. Yeah, of course, because God is nothing but <laughs> man's imagination. But more, Ragnar, that. God who created man is retroactively reborn in man. Only through man, God comes back to himself, which is why this point is so traumatic for, uh, for, uh, 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 for some critics of Marxism and Hegel. I don't know it by far, but I found some crazy right-wing guy, his podcast, where he claims that in a radically anti-Marxist way that the origin of all evil in modern world, and he names the sources of this evil, Kant, but more Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, and then he goes even into, in a totally crazy way, Stalin, Hitler, and so on, is this uh, uh, late medieval mysticism. And he gets this correct. Are you talking about James Lindsay? Maybe. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Go on. No, but, but uh, uh, sorry. This comes with old age. But what I like so much is that he sees this line because, you know, Hegel does say that 
Jacob Böhme is the first true German philosopher. Why? Precisely because, as what you said, he sees the arrival of man not as something like God is up there, blah, 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 then he creates man, but who cares, you know? And you know where comes a true, the truly dialectical point? Here, your work entered. Now, a stupid reader would have thought, but wait a minute, if aliens come, doesn't this mean Christianity is over? You know, in the sense of, for Christianity, God exists through man. But how then do you deal with alien life? No, I think there you are confronted with the paradoxical core of Christianity. You know, I want Christianity without this stupid heliocentric stance, sorry, uh, uh, humano-anthropocentric stance that, you know, as if God put all the beds on us and so on. I would lie at uh, my... No, he, he rolled the dice on many planets. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so I know cool. you always, I, I know you always say with Einstein, uh, God doesn't play dice. You say, well, don't tell God what to do. I think he's just rolling the dice, you know? Uh, but this was Neil, Neil Moore, yeah, who gave the proper answer. <laughs> To this one no no but uh, what i want to say is that here this may surprise you i'm now in contact with some great names of contemporary writers on quantum physics or rather mechanics and i don't know what will come out of this but it's Fascinating. Lee, Lee Smolin, Lee Smolin is probably one of the, on, on the leading edge. I yes, would say. through that other guy, uh, uh, Sean Carlo Carroll. Ravelli. And Ravelli, I mean, contact with Ravelli, but through uh, that, I, the problem is, we almost already arranged a conversation with Lee Smolin. The problem is what I heard that, you know, that he is very, very ill now. I don't know about cancer, leukemia, whatever, but like, it's a problem. I think he, I think, I think, let, let me say this about Lee Smolin, because I've been following his work for a long time, especially in his book, he has the three paths to quantum gravity. And let me propose these three paths to you, because I think you're walking the third path of quantum gravity. Oh. Because he said the first path of quantum gravity is basically like, quantum mechanics sublating general relativity. The second path is where general relativity sublates quantum mechanics. Yeah. But the third but the third path is not capable to be sort of, um, let's say, cordoned off by sort of the main paradigms of physics, yeah. but requires philosophical, spiritual uh, reflection, including questions of religion, including questions of, let's say, idealism and materialism. And I think that this third yeah. path yeah. Which has yeah. not gotten... This third path, which has not been explored or supported institutionally, I think that in some sense, your philosophy is laying the groundwork for this third path. So maybe both of us, although I'm part of an institution, but I'm a pure researcher. I'm not part of any academic machinery proper. And you, you know, maybe this, although it may appear superficially that we are at a disadvantage, who knows? Maybe this will turn to be our advantage. In, because I, there is something in social sciences with this uh, 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 cancel culture, political correctness, and yeah, so yeah. on. In pure sciences, even, this new conformism of institutions is terrifying. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. No, so my so like the, the end of the end of my doctoral thesis, I try to also approach this issue of quantum gravity. But uh, the, sorry, the, the, the doctoral thesis, you see, this is not this is what already you did. This is not a, a real material. This is already published. Global brain singularity. Uh, yeah, so like, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the idea there with this third path of quantum gravity is that it's not like the third path has to reflectively include the historical social community itself. That if if yeah, if yeah, the, yeah, like, yeah. And, and if you don't include the historical social community itself, and this is what the physicists in so like my the, so I'll throw this back to you is that my and then we'll get into the ontological implications of quantum physics. Yeah. But 
the 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 problem is 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 in the last 100 years the smartest people on the planet have been dedicated to trying to resolve the question of quantum gravity but they haven't been able to do it so it's not a question of intelligence it's a question of the philosophical framing yeah yeah and yeah. It, and if they don't get the philosoph and so and and i think that this is the main thing and this is the question i'll throw to you is and and which i think you make clear in in, in yeah, this yeah. book Christ, uh, uh, christian atheism is it's this move from, let's say, Descartes and classical physics, where you have this problem of a deceiving God, laws without exception, to Hegel and quantum physics, where you have God who is himself deceived, where you universalize the exception yeah, yeah, and it yeah, yeah, escapes yeah, control. Yeah, yeah. But this move is so precise. So I want people, even if they're in the materialist sciences, to know that this philosophical foundation you're providing, which I think is the third path of quantum gravity, yeah, yeah. is a move from Descartes to Hegel classical physics to quantum physics but i'll leave it to yeah. you with that yeah although you know can i let's begin now i will soon get tired but i want to i want to use opportunity let's begin now by a little bit of foretaste of me questioning you you know <laughs> okay. when you said hegel's logic and so on i will ask you a very primitive, simple question, but sometimes one has to raise them. They are difficult. My question is, I be, I'm dealing with this in now in my new manuscript on which I'm working. The difference between Robert Brandom and, uh, and Pippin, basically, I don't agree with any of them, but there is one difference. Uh, Pippin is uh, more Kantian transcendentalist. Pippin, in his new book, I don't know if it already appeared. I got uh, just the digital uh, proof version. Uh, Pippin's point is that Hegel's logic is, under quotation mark, eternal. It's transhistorical. It's the eternal frame of categories for all possible knowledge of humanity, whatever. And then he, Pippin, goes so far to even claim that why are after logic nature and spirit? That this is contingent. It could have been different. Like maybe he would have said, okay, there are aliens. Okay, we are in contact with them. They will be a totally new form of life, which will not fit our, what we see as our human spirituality. But he would have said, you know, here I see his Kantian approach that the only truly eternal thing is logic. And that nature and human history, spirit, are just two empirically given domains where you can apply logic. While Brandom is more radically historical, his point is that, nonetheless, you cannot say here is eternal logic, then we have their nature, okay, let's apply logic to nature or whatever, and history, but that with new advances in science, in whatever, or in our experience, aliens, logical category themselves would be affected. Now I ask you, what is your position here? I would just like to know it. A simple sure. question. Sure. So I've actually... I, it's it, obvious it, that, uh, that if aliens enter, it will be uh, uh, unthinkably radical. But let's be more modest. Do you think that I'm tempted to be to say a no, but you know more probably than me here. What do okay, you so I, think? No, no. What do you think? Do you think that Hegel's logic, or the categories there, all of them in the structure of syllogism, category, is still strong enough to to serve as a frame for quantum physics? Or have to have we to change rewrite the logic? Simple question. That's my yeah. Simple question. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so 
let me so I, I do try to approach this um in the upcoming philosophy portal not I mean I, I I frame it this as a question in the upcoming anthology logic for the global brain um and, and so so I think it's a fantastic question the first thing I'll say and I've got two points to make mm -hmm. is the first is sort of building on sort of a point you make in Christian atheism which, which is that I would say logic's eternity has to be historicized in yeah, the yeah, way that yeah. you're that's, saying that's with the fourth with the fourth depends. and you sorry yeah. it's the same so that's crucial to interrupt you but it's the same paradox as that of my title now we come at the metaphysically deepest point you said eternal logic should be historicized yeah but not in the vulgar sense of part of no no it's still eternal but eternity yes. is Self. Not in a historicist sense. Eternity. Not in a historicist should sense. be historicized. So. But like exactly, so like the in the idea of the fourth, the fourth model of the the block universe model, the fourth temporal model, where you rewrite the past and the future in the present. Yeah, yeah. And so the, basically, it's the event of the alien where the rewriting of the past and the future would take place. Yeah, yeah. Potentially, yeah, yeah. but now this is, but now even I would say on a deeper level. And this is the, the the point I try to make in logic for the global brain is, and this is, I, I generalize, you could say it in the alien context, but I would say you could also say it in the post-human context. Yeah. It's, it, to me, it's about the status of contradiction. To me, in the, the logic for the global, the, the science of yeah. logic, it's all about the status of contradiction as positive. And the question, and I think even like we could see um, a lot of Deleuzean philosophy and the, the idea of the becoming animal is yeah. sort of like maybe a symptom of the historicity of Hegel's logic in the sense that do we transcend the logic of contradiction itself on the level of body spirit? So like when you emphasize, for example, that Christianity uh, embodies the contradiction of spirit becoming body, yeah. Um, and, and 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 the body and the material body is on the yeah. same level as spirit. This contradiction is the contradiction that I think Hegel's logic is most useful for on the level of the doctrine of concept, yeah. subjective becoming. Yeah. And it, is this contradiction itself historicized? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Precisely. my question. Yeah. That's my question. Now I will tell you something horrible. I am so weak that we will have to stop slowly. But okay. <laughs> I am so weak because it, I'm saying this sincerely. In all the podcasts that I had in last year, I never got so much invested. So I will tell you what I will do now. I will, and you can use this. So I'm saying this for the public. I will go to my apartment. I will take two, three stanaxes to calm myself down. And then I will uh, start to write about this, enter the alien, you know. So it's good that we did this publicly, because if I look deep into my evil, you know. And you know what's the only real proof that I appreciate you? It's dirty paradox. It's that I envy you, hate you, and my dream would have been, how couldn't I see this myself? So I will not do it. That's why it's good that you have me now on tape, you know. My dream would be to steal, uh, steal your ideas and then maybe in my next book put a small, you know, this ultimate lie, footnote. After I finish this book, I learned that, uh, that, uh, uh, my, my, that my friend, uh, 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 Tadell, uh, had some similar ideas, blah, blah, after I, you know, this typical way of lying and exploiting, you know. So that's what I will do now. Sorry, this was too much. So let's, the only solution proposal is this one. Maybe even in two, three months or before, allow me to look into your stuff and yeah. then we will definitely repeat this conversation Fantastic. With me being your Stalinist interrogator, you know. And like okay. I will to to give a boost to your thinking, you know, I will like let's say these are the keys to Gulag, no? 
I would say like, tell me. I, I, was, I, I had to mention the gulag. I was going to mention the gulag. Yeah, I knew that was a, always a potential threat. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, but okay. I, so don't kill me. I am at the end now. You see, this all right, is all right. my, but I'm very grateful to you. And uh, let's begin to really work in. Sounds good. Sounds good. No, so no, I don't believe in this collective work uh, that you know. You sit at the table and uh, debate, blah blah. No, I believe in this shock thinking. Like for me, you talk with somebody, and he or she says something tremendous, and then uh, you have to say, "Now I step back and uh, I have to put it down before it disappears." That's for me true collaboration. I don't believe in this literal collective thinking, you know, uh, 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 brainstorming at its most stupid. All right. So, well, pardon I'll, me, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go. I don't, I don't want you to. Yeah. But uh, uh, I have to stop now. But my God, we really, I think, are onto something because you know where is the second point that I find important in what you are doing? Because... I noticed this, how, although we may appear to talk about alien civilizations, ontology, blah, blah, nonetheless, there is always a paradoxical short circuit, direct contact between these eternal questions and political issues today. You clearly see this also. Things are changing. I think that here I agree with you. It's not that it's not that as Heideggerians would have put it all too easily. We uh, we uh, that uh, 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 technique science is just the application of some a priori structure of disclosure of being <laughs> is that in true radical changes. We, in the most radical sense, my innermost spiritual sense, also will have to change. And I think we don't, as you hinted at some point, we don't even have to talk only about uh, 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 literally aliens. It's much more radical. It's even with the, for example, here I agree with some commentators who say, till now, the question of freedom and so on, determinism, the are we fully determined, was an abstract theoretical question. We could be deconstructionists, claim blah, 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 we could be determinists, but when we talk and interact, we interacted in a traditional, rational, subjective way. You say an argument, you try to convince me, I give my own, I try, but with the latest advances in brain studies and all that, this gap is disappearing. Because today, to talk about what is freedom is not just a social question. No, it's becoming a scientific question. How our brain works? Is there a space for freedom there? And so on, you know. So we live in an extraordinary time where the Highest metaphysical questions concern our daily life, literally. So let me, could you have time for a quick story? Just one last point. Okay. So um, the next the next class at Philosophy Border, we're going to be teaching the philosophy of right, which I think has a lot to do with basically, okay, the, question, with, right. with basically the question of freedom. Yeah. And the question of freedom as political, as well as science, as well as scientific. Yeah. And I think that contemporary sciences in the way that we've been critiquing them, yeah. sort of vulgar materialist yeah, sciences, yeah. they always approach the question of freedom with reference to studies that only have to do with animals. Like, for example, I study baboons or I study yeah, other yeah, creatures yeah, 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 and, and then yeah, I, I yeah, see yeah. that the neuronal connections yeah, and I can yeah. see that the decision the baboon makes is already predetermined by the neuronal yeah, yeah, connections. Yeah, 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 but the, the question I think that Hegel's bringing to us in the philosophy of right is that, no, it's an imminent socio-political issue that will also get enwrapped in sort of material science in a historical way, yeah, yeah. which I don't think is being approached in the mainstream discussions about freedom and determinism. So no, I think to that point, it's 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 essential that yeah. we approach it. 
But again, uh, to privately conclude, I'm really sad. I will try to check it up again. What's happening with Lee Smolin? What I heard is very sad. Yeah. I, I'm mentioning this publicly. If this will reach him, I wish him all the best. And I hope that I was a victim of exaggerated rumors, that it's not right. so bad. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Thanks for your time and for and everyone watching. Christian Atheism. We keep in touch. Don't forget yeah. immediately now, even before you go to the toilet to urinate or what you do now, send me the references of your Enter the Alien. I will. I will. I, okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right. Peace out. The next Philosophy Portal course focuses on Hegel's Philosophy of Right, a text which represents Hegel's most mature political notion of rights. The course starts May 18th, 2024. To find out more, visit philosophyportal.online. Hegel's philosophy of right approaches a science exploring the political tension between will and world, as well as their collision into family, community, state, and world spirit. The course runs through May and June, with the first class starting May 18th. There will be five lectures and discussions hosted by myself, Cadell Last, as well as two exegetical reading spaces with philosopher Dimitri Kroimans. You will get access to these courses for a lifetime, as well as an invitation to participate in a student-led conference and the opportunity to submit your own publication for a student-led anthology process. To learn the foundation of Hegel's mature political notion this May and June, Sign up now at philosophyportal.online, and I hope to see you on the other side. Did you know that Philosophy Portal is a membership community hosting four different live events every month? These events include Concept Cave, a space to learn core concepts, The Edge, a space to explore the unconceptualized, Thought Lab, a space to learn with thought leaders, and Real Talk, a space to get real in personal self-relation. In April 2024, we will be hosting a concept cave on the concept of jouissance, The Edge on discomfort with theologian Barry Taylor, a thought lab on sex, evil, and forgiveness with philosopher Nina Power, and a real talk on living eros with coach Pamela von Savaljar. To learn more or to get involved, sign up at philosophyportal.online. Philosophy Portal also focuses on publishing community works. We have so far published Enter the Alien, inspired by Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, and Abyssal Arrows, inspired by Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. To find out more, visit philosophyportal.online. You can also find my solo books, Global Brain Singularity, focused on the relation between humans and technological singularity, Systems and Subjects, focused on the relation between general system science and continental philosophy, and Sex, Masculinity, and God, a trialogue about sexual energy and theology. You can find all of these works at philosophyportal.online.